Okay, I think we're close enough to time to start saying hello. So I'm gonna say hello. Um, hi, I'm Vivian New. I'm the president of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the California Native Plant Society. And I wanna welcome you to our talk tonight, the natural history of the San Bruno Mountains. And uh, before we go into the talk, I wanna let you know a little bit about the California Native Plant Society and our chapter. So CNPS, uh, we're a nonprofit environmental organization. We've been around since 1965 and we have over 10,000 members in 35 chapters all over California and now also including Baja, California. And our chapter covers Santa Clara as well as Southern San Mateo County. So the talk tonight is actually right at the edge of our border. And in fact, it's slightly disputed land, I think, between us and Yerba Buena to the north. <laughs> We're all buddies though, really, truly. <laughs> Anyways, our mission is to save California's native plants and the habitats. And we do that by bringing together science, education, conservation, and gardening. And this is powering the native plant movement. So we truly, believe in it and we hope all of you do as well. If you are not currently a member, please do consider joining. There's a lot of great benefits. You get two fabulous journals, one named Flora, which has a lot of fun articles in it. And our other one, which is actually in the process of being renamed, um, Fremantia, which was used to be Fremantia, um, and it's a more science-based journal. Mm -hmm. You also will receive the Blazing Star, which is our chapter newsletter, and that's put out every other month. And it lists all of our chapters goings on, as well as some interesting articles. And you also get discounts at local nurseries and a, a number of other benefits as well. You can find out more about it by going to cnps.org join, and uh, you can sign up there. So if you're not a member, please consider joining. And this talk is part of our native plant lecture series. We have talks at least three times a month, sometimes four on Wednesdays at 7.30. And we have uh, our next three talks, oops, actually, sorry, double listed a talk. I am going blind on, these, on doing these slides. So next week we have Dee Himes, who is going to be talking about uh, taking up plant tanky to blah, sorry, tongue twisting today, um, taking close up plant ID pictures with a camera phone. Dee is a fabulous photographer and she's also really good at plant ID. And one of the things that's challenging is getting the right things in your picture. And Dee will explain how to do all of that with your, your camera phone. Um, next week, and it's really just once, not twice. Uh, we will have Getting Started with Native Plants by Eradica Becca, as it said, Katha, Kath, um, who will be talking about native getting started with native plants in your garden. And the week after that, we're going to have a great talk on succulents, growing and appreciating them um, in the garden and in the wild. And there's more coming. So, uh, Stay tuned, join the chapter if you're not a member, you'll get notices. And all of our talks are recorded on our YouTube channel. So if you miss a talk or you wanna go back and see something that in, in a talk that you've seen and you just wanna review it or share it with a friend, you can go to our YouTube channel and uh, the URL is listed down there, but you can also go to our website, cnps-scv.org and all the links are on there. And uh, our chapter nursery is the primary way our chapter gets funds. So we really appreciate it when people buy plants from us. And currently you can do that online. We don't have in nursery shopping right now, uh, but we can shop 24 hours from home. And then you can either schedule a pickup at our nursery, or if you live between Belmont and San Jose, um, you can have plants delivered. And in February, uh, with every order, we are giving away a free nursery grown Dudleya um, to help wear, raise awareness of the big Dudleya poaching problem. And also there is some pending legislation in, the legisl in our state legislature right now, which CNPS has been uh, uh, supporting uh, to increase the penalties for people that are caught poaching. So we do want people to be aware about this 
really serious problem um, that's going on in California right now. And as I mentioned before, this is uh, all the proceeds go to our chapter, and this is the primary way our chapter supports itself. So we, you know, anything you buy, you can feel great about getting the native plants and and other things like books, signs, and T-shirts. Uh, but everything you purchase goes towards supporting the chapter. And we're always adding more plants. So if you don't see something that you want, um, please check back in because uh, at, like every week or two, we are adding more plants to the inventory on our website. And to get to the nursery, there's a very long URL there at the bottom of the screen, but more easily, you can simply go to cnps-scv.org and the link is right there at the top of the page. And if, you're, if you enjoyed this and our other talks and you're not currently on our news mailing list, I strongly urge you to join it. It's free. Uh, it's a Google group. The address to join is right there at the bottom of your screen. But again, just go to our website and the information on how to join is on there. And we would love to have more help. So if you have some spare time and you're comfortable with Zoom, or actually, if you're just comfortable using a keyboard, mouse, and dealing with Windows, copying and pasting, that's really all you need to be able to do. We can train you to do everything else, but we would love to have more help with our talks. There's a three, a couple different positions, Q&A moderator, co-host. Uh, we do all the training. Uh, there are positions where you don't have to be in front of the screen. You're just in the background helping but we would love to have more help. So if this sounds like something you would be interested in doing, please get in contact. Johanna Kwan and Madeline Morrow are both uh, are working on recruiting people. So their information is there at the bottom of the screen, um, but there, it's also on our website, which again, cnps-scv.org. And before we start on the talk, I'm was just curious if uh, there are people who have never been to one of our talks before. Uh, I would love, we would love to know how you found out about us. So if you don't mind just putting that in the chat uh, and welcome if, it, if, you're, if it's your first time and welcome back if you've been with us before. Um, before we get started, I just, a point of housekeeping, uh, please stay muted during the talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat at any point. At the end of the talk, our moderator will read all the questions to our speakers. So again, if you hear anything in the talk that you're curious about or just wanna know something from one of them, please go ahead and type that into the chat, whether you're on YouTube or on Zoom directly, we will make sure that information is read to our speakers at the end. And now I'm going to turn it over to Judy Fennerty, who is going to be introducing our speakers. Judy. Thank you, Vivian. Um, we're pleased tonight to welcome our neighbors to the north, so to speak, uh, David Nelson and Doug Alshouse. Um, David Nelson, who is going to speak first, is an orthopedic hand surgeon who has long been a student of nature. He took a CMPS tour of San Bruno Mountain led by Doug Alshouse in 2013, just eight years ago and was hooked by the beauty of the mountain and Doug's talent for explaining nature. When he proposed doing a book about the mountain to Doug, he discovered that Doug was already working on one and welcomed his participation. So that's a nice story. Doug Allshouse lives on San Bruno Mountain, 100 be feet below the saddle trail and has been exploring, studying and recording their natural history since 1981. He was a founder and officer of the Friends of San Bruno Mountain beginning in 1996, as well as of the original Mission Blue Nursery in 2001. He has been working on a seven year project with David Nelson, writing an updated flora called the Natural History of the San Bruno Mountains. So welcome David and Doug. Thank you. Um, I'll go right to sharing the screen. And I think you have to give me permission. Uh, let's see. We should be able to also, here, I'll stop. Got it. There we go. Okay. And 
There you go. I presume you can see my slides. Looks good. Good. All right. So this is about San Bruno Mountain State and County Park. I'm David Nelson. And my uh, the first author of the book is my good buddy, Doug Allshaus. And we're both members of Urban Buena Chapter, Your Neighbors to the North. And we both have affiliations with the park. Uh, the book is called The Natural History of the San Bruno Mountains. Here are Doug and I at the office working uh, on San Bruno Mountain. And we had about five years of field work and then three years of painful uh, paperwork uh, creating the book. Uh, Doug has written 538 plant descriptions. Uh, 80 of them are new. I've taken 35,000 photos just to get the 538 species illustrated. We're trying to set a new standard because a lot of books just have a picture of the flower. We have a picture of the flower, the leaf, the whole plant and any special feature of it. Um, it will be published by Heyday Books and we're expecting fall or winter of 2022. All right. Now, where is San Bruno Mountain? Right here is San Francisco. And right here is the uh, county line. And um, right below it here, that's San Bruno Mountain. Okay, so it's just in the northern part of San Mateo County. Now, it is a wonderful mountain that we've all seen as we drive by on either 280 or, or 101. Um, and, uh, you know, um, Vivian, I, I just got back from a, a trip. And if you don't mind, there's just a couple of slides I'd like to show before I go on with the talk, just to, to share it with you, because they're really nice. Let me exit the talk. Um, okay, here. It's only take just a little bit. It's um, sure. Here. Go ahead. Is it, okay, I'll try to do it pretty quickly. Here we go. It's right here. Um, in the morning, we'd get up and go up these narrow paths up the steep mountain, and it was just gorgeous. I mean, thick foliage. Uh, it's so thick that unless you're on an established path, you can't go anywhere. Um, sometimes the paths went up dry canyons with these weird trees. Uh, sometimes you go up a canyon with a little creek or something. Um, the foliage was amazing. The ferns are taller than people, which you just don't get around here. Uh, and the plants, although they look like our species, they're the same genus, but they're different. I mean, have you ever seen a tree that was all flowers like that? And then when you get to the very top of the mountain, you get the windward ocean breeze, and all of a sudden you lose the forest and it's a, a, a desert. It's very dry. The plants are weird. Uh, they're covered with short hairs to try to keep their moisture. And they tend to be bristly to uh, ward off herbivory and things like that. Um, and did I hear a question? Where, where was I? I was on San Bruno Mountain. Every single picture is from San Bruno Mountain. When you drive by on the freeway, that's what you see. And you think it's a bald mountain with radio towers. But actually, it's a complex of many different micro habitats. And if you just take a uh, hike, which most people do along the ridge trail, you don't see what is really there. Um, Doug and I have been scouring this place every weekend for five years, and there are still places we haven't been. And we don't call it San Bruno Mountain. We call it San Bruno Mountain University. It's always teaching us interesting things. So let's go into the talk. What makes San Bruno Mountain so special? We all know it's got special plants. Well, it started in 1925 when Jepson wrote this, his first book, and he listed 10 different areas of high endemism. Zone 10 was this, and he called it the Franciscan, pardon me, Franciscan zone. Now, he did not have an intimate knowledge of the Bay Area, Jim Roof was a self-educated botanist who grew up uh, near uh, San Bruno Mountain, played there as a child, really knew the area, and he changed it. And he said, no, the zone of endemism really is the San Francisco Peninsula. The little green dot is San Bruno Mountain, and then just a little bit of the Marin Headlands. So he called this the Franciscan zone, but Mike Vasey, the... Um, Man's need a specialist said for a small area like this, it's really a landscape, not a zone. 
So the question is, for me, was Roof Right, is the Franciscan landscape special? And if so, why is this an area of high endemism? It does have unique plants, but the question is, why? All these other counties around it, we share some of the plants, but not all the plants. What makes San Bruno Mountain special? That's the question I ask myself. And I think the answer lies primarily in geology. So with your permission, I'm gonna go a little bit into geology. The unique plants of San Bruno Mountain are there because part of some of them are paleo endemics. That is plants that used to be widespread, but are now only in a small area. An example say would be in California, the redwood tree is a paleo endemic. Now you also have neo endemics. That is things who have, or that have evolved in the area um, and manzanitas in California would be a neo-endemic. And we certainly have four neo-endemic manzanitas on San Bruno Mountain. The other thing that makes a plant area unique is the soil. And the soil comes from geology. And we'll be talking about that. And the other is climate. Climate has two factors. It's the water regime and the temperature regime. And I'm gonna talk some about the water. So geology and water will be the beginning of the talk. Now, the San Francisco Peninsula, here's a drawing of it, is formed of three terrains. And one of them is the San Bruno Mountain terrain. Now, what's a terrain? A terrain is actually short for a tectonostratigraphic terrain, but what it is is a fragment of crustal material that's been scraped off one tectonic plate and accreted or placed onto another tectonic plate. And it's surrounded by faults and it has a unique geologic history that's different from all the surrounding areas. The example that geologists sometimes like to use is you take an Oreo and you shear the two cookie parts, the cream filling bunches up like this. So if you pull it this way, all of these little lines form. Each of those would be a terrain. Another example would be if you scraped your boot that had a bunch of dirt on it on a log, each time you scrape it, you'd be scraping a new line of mud. And in terms of plate tectonics, that would be a terrain. So a terrain again is a fragment of crustal material scraped off one tectonic plate and accreted onto another tectonic plate, surrounded by faults and it has unique geologic history from the surrounding areas. Actually, all of California west of the Sierra foothills was accreted onto the North American plate as a series of 33 different terrains. One of the most recent ones added to North America was the San Bruno mountain terrain. The Farallon plate, which is oceanic crust, was subducted under the Western edge of the North American plate during the Mesozoic era. And part of that was the San Bruno mountain terrain. So here we have the Farallon plate coming, going underneath the North American plate and the Alcatraz terrain the Marin Headlands Terrain and the San Bruno Mountain Terrain form parts of San Francisco and the San Bruno Mountain Terrain forms all of San Bruno Mountain. Now, what kind of rocks constitute our terrain? We have gray wacky, radiolarian chert and some serpentine. And I wanna review these. Gray wacky, there's two examples from San Bruno Mountain. The left one shows a fairly coarse grain. You could see the sand grains. And on the right, it's so fine, you can't see them. So gray wacky is a hard sandstone characterized by multiple sizes of sand grains. And the way they say it in geology is poorly sorted. Now, the interesting thing about gray wacky is it violates the laws of sedimentation. In the laws of sedimentation, you should have similar layers all together. Here is a microscopic view of the left hand of those two uh, bits of gray wacky. And if you just look at the dark uh, gray sand grains, you can see some are very big and some are quite small. That's what they mean by poorly sorted. So we're primarily gray wacky. Now a rose is a rose is a rose, but sand is not sand is not sand. A rose is a rose because it belongs in that species of genus, but sand is not categorized by what it is. It's categorized by its size, not its material. And each little sand grain has a history, and you can often tell a lot about its history by examining it. So poorly suited, 
sorted sand comes from undersea avalanches on the continental shelf and the sand doesn't get a chance to sort itself out. So it comes from the continental shelf right next to the continent. The sand at San Bruno Mountain Greywacky has been traced. It comes from the Sierra Nevada. Um, and using detrital zircon, uranium to lead geochronology, it's 52 million years old. Now, how did it get to San Bruno Mountain? That's a question we'll defer for a little bit. Now, radiolarian chert is the next. Now, this is uh, some radiolarian chert from San Francisco along Oceanosy Boulevard. And it's amazing how many geologic books have this uh, formation on them. Here is a piece of radiolarian chert that had some iron in it, was exposed to oxygen. This is from Mount Davidson, which is also uh, a terrain. That's the uh, Marin Headlands terrain. But you notice it's parallel surface top and the bottom because it's a ribbon, it's a sediment. And here's the same uh, form, but not exposed to oxygen. And so it's a light green. Now, radiolarian chert comes from the deep pelagic ocean. Radiolarians are single celled animals and they have a skeleton made of silicon dioxide. It's dissolved in the ocean, they take it out, they create their skeleton. But when they die, their skeletons settle to the bottom. And a million years creates a one millimeter layer of radiolarian chert. And the question is, how does that get to San Bruno Mountain if it's in the middle of the ocean? And the final one we have is serpentine. And serpentine is quite different. It comes from the mantle, not the crust. It's ultramafic rock. And the term ultramafic, the MA is for magnesium and the FIC comes from ferric for iron. And these are heavy elements, so they don't stay in the crust, they've settled to the mantle, but serpentine puts it up on the, uh, uh, the crust. So the question is how'd they get there? Gray wacky comes from the continental shelf and it's part of the crust. Radial iron shirt comes from the deep ocean and it's part of the crust and serpentine is part of the upper mantle. Well, the way we understand that is plate tectonics is the unifying theory for geology, just as evolution is the unifying theory for biology. Nothing in biology makes any sense outside of the concept of evolution and same thing for geology. And what happened is tectonic plates have put the San Bruno mountain terrain on the continent and San Francisco is the type location for the Franciscan formation. So not only do plants have type localities, rock does as well. The Franciscan formation was key in our understanding of the accretionary mechanism of land formation. So plate tectonics and accretionary prism formed San Bruno Mountain and San Bruno Mountain and the San Francisco formation, Franciscan formation helped to understand plate tectonics. So getting off geology, the area of San Francisco plus San Bruno Mountain and a little bit of the Marin Headlands has a unique geology, so it has unique soil. The soil in Santa Clara is a totally different soil. Okay. So San Francisco and San Bruno Mountain both share very similar geology. Our gray wacky came from the Sierras. San Francisco's gray wacky came from the Rockies, but they're quite similar. And therefore we share many of the unique plants. And if you could come back to San Francisco in 1816, at the time of the Kotzebue expedition and the Rurik visited our harbor, you'd see on board Chamiso, you see his name all over the plants, Horus, we see his name, uh, Escolts for the poppy, and Romanzov, who financed the uh, uh, expedition, we see it in plants as well. If you came back then, you would see a different set of plants. And if you want to see those plants today, come to San Bruno Mountain, we've got them. Okay, so what makes it unique? It's our geology, but it's also our water. Now, we all know California has a Mediterranean climate, cool, wet winters, warm, hot summers. The time of the real stress to the plants is the warm to hot, dry summers, and water is the key that'll make uh, the difference. Now, here's San Bruno Mountain, looking out over the ocean, you can see the fog out there. And the fog starts coming onto the mountain around one o'clock or so in the afternoon. And 
the atmosphere is the second largest body of water on the planet. And as the winds blow on shore, this moisture comes on shore and it changes our uh, water budgets and our water regime. And Doug, you're now live. Um, and it blows onto the mountain and it gets deposited on the plants, particularly on the trees. And you see that tree there? I have sat under that tree in an August day in the driest year in a century. And as soon as you sit down, your pants are totally soaked in water. So this um, fog brings a lot of water onto the shore and changes our Mediterranean high, um, climate. And here you can see uh, rain falling down on the land. But this is not rain. This is fog drip. This is from fog forest where the uh, fog hits the trees and it just starts dripping uh, like that in the middle of summer. So I was always told tree drip is what causes the mountain to be wet. But wait a minute, tree drip, where are the trees? There are no real native trees on most of it. The dense stands of the tall trees are all exotics. So tree drip is not the right answer. The quantity of tree drip is proportional to the cross-sectional area of the tree and decreases exponentially as you go away from its windward side. Jim Roof observed that the fog drip from the exotic trees creates an abnormal amount of water to the understory, and the result is a microenvironment that is not representative of the Franciscan landscape. And here are some tall Australian weeds. We call them uh, eucalyptus trees. They bring a lot of water out of the fog, and all they do is grow great growths of ivy and Himalayan blackberry, and the only native they really grow is poison oak, and somehow maybe that's not the best plant to be growing. So tree drip is not the answer. What is fog's effect on the water budgets of the plants? Well, the answer is decreased evapotranspiration, increased foliar uptake, increased humidity and decreased temperature, and a decreased solar radiation to the soil. Now, let me go through those. Evapotranspiration. Photosynthesis requires constant CO2, and the stomata are open for C3 photosynthesis, and they're bringing in CO2 all the time. Well, here's the stoma, and the CO2 is coming in, but at the same time, oxygen is going out. We know that, but the trouble is water is going out at the same time. And in fact, the stomata are losing a tremendous amount of water. The humidity in the leaf interior is 100%. 98% of the water that's brought up for the roots is lost due to evapotranspiration. So it's a huge problem for a plant. 400 water molecules are lost for every CO2 molecule that's gained. Water molecules are smaller and they uh, uh, diffuse quicker. So although fog drip is the most obvious effect of fog on water plant budgets, actually outside of the tall forest, the most important effect of fog is decreased evapotranspiration. We have a lot of fog. Another thing is increased foliar uptake. When we were kids, we were taught that roots were the sole path for water to come into a plant. But as a matter of fact, the leaves and the stems also absorb water. A study that's done in Santa Cruz showed that Polystichum unitum had the highest foliar uptake of the plants they tested. And the lowest was the laurel. And you can think of it, it's got a waxy leaf. So increased humidity and decreased temperature is the third effect. It's independent of the evapotranspiration because it decreases water loss. The inside of the leaf is 100%. And if the outside uh, humidity goes up, there'll be a lesser gradient and the plants will lose less water. And the final effect of fog is it decreases the solar radiation to the soil, which drives water loss. So the Combined effects of fog are complex. Fog drip is proportional to the cross-sectional area of the tree, but it's not the factor in most of San Bruno Mountain. The main effect is decreased evapotranspiration, also increased foliar uptake, and increased humidity with a decreased temperature, and finally, decreased solar radiation to the soil. So we've looked at geology, and we looked at water for why we have rare plants. And this is part of what it is, because the Mediterranean climate 
is stressful during the summer. And if you add water, you change what plants can live there. So let's look at just a little bit of history and then we'll get to the plants. Jacob Lees in 1835 had married the commandant's sister and he was given a huge land grant. Cañada de Guadalupe, La Visitación y Rodeo Viejo, which stands for the old rodeo place. And here's uh, Guadalupe, here's Visitation, here's Rodeo Viejo. And the map and the grant totally ignored the main feature, San Bruno Mountain, because all the uh, Spanish wanted was the flat land for grasses. In 1884, Charles Crocker, that's the Crocker of the Central Pacific Railroad, bought San Bruno Mountain. Now, back in 1906, garbage was carried out by these uh, Italians. They had to be from Genoa, and um, they uh, would load up their wagons, called a scavenger wagon. This was given to me by one of my patients. That's his grandfather. And what they would do is they'd haul the garbage off. Now, the San Francisco supervisors in around 1890 decided to make it illegal to dump the garbage in San Francisco. So like any enterprising person, you just take the garbage to the city limit and dump it in the next county, which happens to be San Mateo. And the San Francisco continued to do this all the way to 1960. And at the end, we're dumping 650 tons per day right into San Mateo, right in front of San Bruno Mountain. That's it in the background. So the mountains stayed undeveloped because the garbage is right in front of them. They closed the dump in 1960, and all of a sudden you had valuable land right next to San Francisco. So the Crocker Land Company formed West Bay Associates. It was a combination of the Crocker Land Company, the Ideal Cement Company, who claimed they owned the Bay Bottom, and Rockefeller in New York doing the financing. And what they were going to do was flatten the mountain by taking off 250 million cubic yards of earth, put it on a conveyor belt, take it across 101, put it on barges, and bring it down south below the airport. Here's the airport. And they're going to fill in 26 linear miles of coastline below the airport. And then on that flat mountain, uh, they're going to be able to build uh, a city. They could have one city on the uh, Bayfield, be 17 times larger than the Bayfield that was Foster City. And they called the top uh, of the mountain New Manhattan. And it was a city of 50 to 70,000 people. So the city was obliging. They built the Guadalupe Parkway in 1963 in order to facilitate this building. Now, luckily, three naive little old ladies who I'm sure you're all well aware of, looking out through this window, munching almond cookies just before Christmas, thought that the bay was awfully pretty and they didn't want it filled. There had been an article by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers on the Oakland Tribune in uh, um, 1959, saying at the current rate of fill, the bay was going to be a narrow shipping channel. So these three ladies decided they're going to do something about it and they formed Save the Bay. And through their uh, work, the San Francisco Bay Conservation Development Commission was passed in 1965. I've always looked at this and said, Reagan's not looking at the people who created the law. Uh, those are some of the legislators who did it, but it was the ladies who actually did the work. And we owe them a huge debt of gratitude because they saved San Bruno Mountain. So in 1962, West Bay Associates got stopped by the BCDC, but the landowners still owned the land and they still wanted to develop it. So they came up with another idea, Visitation Rancho. And what they're going to do is settle or build on the flat part of the land. So the company was the foremost McKesson company, Crocker Land. This was uh, an artist drawing of uh, the view of San Francisco from the apartments on San Bruno Mountain. And they're going to build it right here in the flat area we call the saddle. A committee of citizens, just as uh, uninformed as Save the Bay, got together and they wanted to save San Bruno Mountain. And in um, 1964, David Schooley and another group or people 
um, formed Committee to Save San Bruno Mountain, which morphed later into San Bruno Mountain Watch, and they are still active in preserving the mountain. But the real blessing was the discovery of some endangered butterflies. There are mountain uh, or mission blues, San Bruno elephants, and um, uh, Clippy silver spot butterflies, and they're endangered. A decade of litigation uh, happened after that. And finally, in 1982, Section 10A was added to the Endangered Species Act, specifically citing San Bruno Mountain as a model of how you could preserve endangered species with the cooperation of a land developer. The majority of the land was given to the county, and in 1983, uh, the San Bruno Mountain Habitat Conservation Plan, rather controversial, was enacted, and three years later, the park was dedicated. And that's why we've been able to preserve rare plants on the mountain. So being as this is CNPS, what you really wanna do is see pretty pictures of uh, plants, not uh, fog or rock. So we've got a list of plants here. We're uh, a bunch of plants to show you, rare, threatened, and endangered species. There are 16 RTE species, five are endemic, arguably there's uh six there's 10 rte species one rte species has been extirpated that gives us our 60. so let's look at our endemic species and actually i'm going to change it to endemic plants because two have not yet been given specific epithets so our um eponymous one is uh arctostaphylos ibricata or san bruno mountain manzanita it's a 1v1 Arctostaphylos pacifica uh, was found by Jim Roof. The first was uh, Alice Eastman, uh, Eastwood. Uh, and then this was found by Jim Roof. It's Pacific Manzanita. Arctostaphylos uversi forma Leo Brewery, found by Roof. Uh, it's been considered but rejected as a rare plant because it's not given a specific name, it's a forma. Arctostaphylos uversi forma suborbiculata. Walter Knight found it. Uh, it's also considered but rejected. Uh, arguably, I want to say that Silene vericunda could be an endemic plant. And there'll be one more that Doug has a uh, part in to play uh, in a little bit later. So these two are the plants that are not species, but um, Parker and Basie, the Bansonia specialists, have said that these are indeed separate species. They don't want to say it formally in writing yet, they need to do the DNA of all of Arctostaphylos uva ursi because of all the uh, Banzanitas. It's the only one that's found in a circumpolar area. It's found in uh, Europe, in Italy, in Greece. So they need to do uh, DNA because the DNA is a little bit unusual. Um, it's polyploid. It can have 26 or 52 chromosomes. So the taxonomy is still evolving. And Parker Vasey have been out on the mountain with us and I've told us this. Okay. So here is uh, Pacific Rock. And here uh, is uh, Arctostaphylos pacifica. Over here is a hybrid. We know it's got some uh, relationship to Arctostaphylos monteraensis, but it's unique. And there's other hybrids over here. So on the mountain, there are hybrids we haven't even yet identified. We're waiting until we get the text of the uh, DNA. But Parker Vasey have said that San Bruno Mountain and Pacific Rock is ground zero for species uh, of Manzanitas. So many of them are polyploid and that gives rise to more um, hybrids. And it's the world center for all Manzanitas. That is 105 of the 106 named species occur in the California floristic province which is, you know, includes just a little bit of territory outside of the state of California. The Central Coast is the center for Manzanita diversity and San Bruno Mountain is the center for speciation. And Pacific Rock is ground zero. It's a lot of fun. Okay, so that gives us our list. Let's look at some. Um, now, non-endemic, uh, Forma coactilis, Lysingia germanorum, Helianthia castanea, the Mount Diablo sunflower, Monteraensis, 
Corazanthi cuspidata, the spine flower, Kalinzia multicolor, and Arabis blepharophilia. And our San Francisco wallflower, Erisibum franciscatum, and Iris longipetala. We're going to see all of these in a little bit. And we found some Plagiobothrus corisianus, and we'll show you pictures of that. Now, some have not been seen in more than 27 to 30 years. One of them is this one, the San Francisco owl's clover. We believe it's gone. It tended to grow within about two meters vertically from the ocean. That's all been developed. So let's look at some of our endemics. This is a uh, manzanita dike. And all of these plants here are um, San Bruno Mountain manzanita, the Ibricata. And you can see how low they are. They're typically not growing in this area more than about 15 centimeters or so. And you can see by, they don't even come as high as people's shoes. Um, and I'm gonna have to move some of this over. There we go. So it's prostrate on the ground. The leaves, as you see here, are overlapped. That's where the name imbricated comes from because they're imbricated like um, shingles on a roof. They're a light green color with long glandular uh, hairs on them. You can see that on the stems. They're lobed and chordate at the base and along the edge. Uh, you can see it's serrated. And these are the stomata. The upper one is the upper surface. The lower picture is the lower surface. So it's stomata both on the top and the bottom. Beautiful, uh, lovely white flower. Unfortunately, they're not all that well protected. This is a stand of imbricata that was mowed by PG&E. They were claiming it was in the way of the road. And you can see the road off there to the side. It's up about three feet on this rock ledge. There's no way you could drive there. But if you give a PG&E uh, workman a mowing machine, there's only one thing he knows what to do with it, and that's to mow. Luckily, this has come back quite nicely from its roots. So here is it growing on Manzanita Dyke, and it's quite, um, quite um, uh, prostrate. But here's Doug and our beautiful Margot Bores standing next to some of it, only about 200, 300 yards away on Powerline Ridge, and the same plant is five feet tall. Doug is 5'9", so you can see how tall that plant is. We don't know why they're different here. We suspect it may be the soil, um, but calling it a prostrate plant may be just a soil phenomenon, not intrinsic to the plant. A common garden experiment will be needed to prove the difference. All right, here's another one. This is only two known plants of this, our rarest manzanita. This is Arctostaphylus pacifica, found by Jim Roof. Um, when we started our book, it was rated as 1B2, but we petitioned, since it only have two plants, we petitioned CNPS and we got it changed to a 1B1, which is much more representative of what it really is. So it has spreading leaves. They're not imbricated. It is prostrate, grows about 15 centimeters or so, beautiful white blossoms, short, non-glandular and hairy. You can see the hairs there. And here are leaves. The base uh, is fairly acute. It has a petiole, which the imbricated does not. A dark green upper and a light green lower. And the margin you can see on the left-hand side can be serrate. It's fairly subtle, but it's there. And here is its um, stomata pattern. Uh, the upper one is the upper surface. The lower one's the lower surface. So that's uh, Arctostaphylus pacifica. Very pretty plant. All right, how about another one? I want to thank Margo Boris for this photo because Doug and I are in the uh, picture there, so we didn't take it. But this is Arctostaphylus uber ursi ver uh, uh, variety Leo Brewery. Now, Leo Brewer was a professor of high temperature chemistry at Berkeley. He actually participated in the um, Manhattan Project. He had a very large native plant garden 
it was said it was the largest in the East Bay. And Jim Roof named it after this professor who also uh, helped to um, get him his job back when he got fired and was part of the uh, group that formed CNPS. So this is a mounded plant. This is plant one, two, and three. And you can see how they're rounded over. Here are the leaves. They're spreading. They're not imbricated. Uh, the base is acute. It does have a petiole. No stomata above, but stomata below. So this is one of the characteristics you could tell from the earlier Manzanita we talked about. And it's a very pretty little plant. Uh, it's got uh, a strong hint of pink. The earlier the blossom, the stronger the pink. The leaves you can see are bifacial. Uh, they're different top and bottom. They're very pink when their uh, blossoms are first coming out and they get to be paler when they mature. But it's a very, very pretty manzanita. Okay, here is another one and you can see it's much smaller. This is suborbiculata or miniature manzanita. It is a forma. So it's been, CBR is considered but rejected. It's not recognized as a species yet because they have to do the DNA. When um, this was first found uh, by uh, Walter Knight, uh, he found an area that's about five meters by 10 meters. Doug and I found an area that's about 50 meters by 100 meters. It's a huge hillside of uh, suborbiculata. Now it's mounded, spreading. Notice the little uh, yellow rim on the leaf. It has a petiole and the bases are acute. And as its name suggests, miniature manzanita, it has a small leaf. 50% or 75% the size of the other plants. Now this, you could uh, quibble with me a little bit and say, this is not truly an endemic. This is Silene Veracunda, San Francisco Campion. A friend of ours, a PhD, is doing the DNA of a related group. And he was doing the DNA of the Veracundas, uh, the Silene as well. And he found that the plants have a very wide variety of DNA. And if you look at the uh, herbarian specimens, the ones from Southern California don't look anything like the ones from Northern California. The type location is Mount Davidson, but San Bruno Mountain has been separated from it from a long time. The plants are highly similar, but we're uh, cooperating with the project and helping fund the project, doing the DNA of the Silene Vericunda from the Presidio, Mount Davidson, San Bruno Mountain, Santa Cruz. And um, uh, Tony Corelli recently let me know of some growing down at Devil's Slide. I was down there last weekend, not yet up. Um, uh, some of the ones I'm tending on Mount Davidson are already blooming. So I was hoping maybe they'd be blooming. But we believe that there are probably some genetic differences between there. So we're keeping uh, all the seeds from each group separate. So we call this Silene Veracunda San Bruno Mountain just to keep its seeds separate uh, and identify differently from those from say Mount Davidson, the type location, Presidio or Santa Cruz. But it's a beautiful little flower. We have approximately 80 to 150 growing on the mountain. It depends on the rain of that particular year. This was one of the first ones we found because we looked for it for years and couldn't find it. And then uh, Mark Sustrich found some, showed them to Doug, and then I joined them and we found 80 that year. Okay, now rare threatened endemic that are not endemic, uh, just other flowers. This is Erebus blephrophilia, coast rock crest. It has one of the most beautiful uh, magenta colors. This is probably a truer color than that previous one. Um, and it just grows in the most outrageous places. Like here's growing in a crack in the rock. So coast rock grass is very beautiful. We have a fair amount of it. It's still a rare plant. Pretty little thing. And here again, growing right up on the rock. Presumably the competition is less there and it survives. So here's Doug 
demonstrating the height of this manzanilla. And this is Arctostaphylos monteraensis. Uh, it's found only on Montera Mountain and San Bruno Mountain. And by far, it's our tallest, most robust manzanilla. And if you look down at the base, the bases are huge. These are like six inch thick bases. Uh, it's found on uh, Pacific Rock and on Manzanita Dyke. It has an imbricated leaf, very closely related to uh, uh, San Bruno Mountain Manzanita. has a very white flower. And here is its leaves. And they look fairly similar to Imbricata, a cute tip chordate base, but they're larger. You can see the three and a half centimeters. Isofacial, one of these, the top, the one on the left is the top, the one on the right is the bottom, they're the same. And they have a, a principally white blossom. And it's a profuse bloomer, uh, it just puts out a ton of flowers. The bees go crazy. And here it is uh, at one time of the year in February. And you come and look at the same plant down in August, all those blooms are now little apples or manzanitas but it uh, uh, produces a tremendous amount of fruit. This is our San Francisco spine flower. It only grows on disturbed sand. As soon as grasses stabilize it, it disappears. So it's growing in the park in an area called the Daly City Dunes. And it's got a very spiky flower. It's a very hairy plant, which helps to uh, preserve moisture in its chosen environment. And these blossoms are about three millimeters across. They're uh, very petite. Here's a close-up view of two, but they're very petite. <sighs> Calenzia multicolor, just a gorgeous little plant. Uh, it tends to grow on scree slopes. We found an area uh, in an old quarry that just has thousands of them. Uh, beautiful little plant. Otherwise, it's very rare on the mountain. Uh, San Francisco wallflower. Uh, I'm sure a bunch of you have come up to San Bruno Mountain and smelled this flower. The first thing you say when you smell it is it just knocks your socks off. It's such a beautiful aroma. And not only do people like it, the insects like it. And you notice this fly here is kind of sitting sideways. What? Oh. <laughs> You look closely, there's a spider right there waiting for you to take a sniff of the flower. So when you sniff, be very careful. This is our uh, coast iris, longipetala. Grows in uh, fairly marshy areas. We don't have a lot of it, uh, but it can be found if you know where to be looking. There's a little meadow where there's a lot of it. Um, this is San Francisco lysingia, lysingia germanorum. Uh, it's also found uh, in the Presidio, but the uh, DNA has been done and they are different. It's a gorgeous flower, but it's only about an inch across from side to side. Um, quite pretty. It only grows on disturbed sand. As soon as the sand gets stabilized by grasses, uh, it will disappear. So there's a group from San Bruno Mountain Watch doing a lot of uh, weeding over there to keep the sand shifting. Now, this is something that was thought to be lost, the Mount Diablo sunflower, Helianthella. But we found some, and here it is uh, when it's young, and it grows a little taller, and it has this wonderful blossom that's about, I don't know, six inches across or so. Um, and they grow out in uh, one area in a fairly steep hillside that's uh, competing with grasses but there's probably a hundred plants in this one location. Presumed extirpated, Chorus's popcorn flower. Um, hadn't been seen for a long time. And I was out with Doug in an area we had not gone before and I was photographing a plant and Doug says, Dave, get off that. I think that's a rare plant. And it was the popcorn flower. And it wasn't extirpated, it was there. And Doug identified it. Um, and this blossom is about three to four millimeters across. Very, very small. And you can see why I was mistaking it for just weeds and standing on it. Uh, Doug forgave me for uh, ruining a good plant. And we found an area that's about three feet by six feet 
and that's all that are there growing on a sand bank uh, along one of the intermittent streams. So Corus's popcorn flower has been found. This is one we have not found and do not expect to find. Um, it has been seen since the 60s. It grows <coughs> very close to the ocean and all those areas have been developed. Okay. Now, these are plants which are locally rare, but you'll recognize them. And I'm sure you've seen them in a bunch of places and we'll be done with this in just a couple of minutes. So uh, there are two plants of pipe stem clematis growing on the mountain. There are three of coffee ferns growing on the mountain in very disparate places, you know, half a mile apart. We were lucky to see some of these and someone pointed out to a man who was doing some uh, removal of ivy. We have about 21 plants in three locations of the trillium. And uh, I noticed uh, one of the flowers that you had showed in the introduction were, the, were a trillium. And they're just a gorgeous plant. But you got to be there early in February or January, you don't see them. And we were able to get some at various stages and see uh, the, the uh, white are sepals, the real um, flower are the red parts. This is a funny story. One time we're at the Mission Blue Nursery and we see this plant and we never found it on the mountain and said, where'd you find this white pitcher sage? And it turns out it grows in one hillock about 30 feet by 30 feet in area and nowhere else. Although in getting lost and having to get helicoptered off the mountain, I found some down in Devil's Arroyo. So there now are two locations, but one location is very small. White pitcher sage. And we found it with the help of the nursery manager and found it in the nursery itself. Now, this is not extirpated, but we thought so at one time. Um, in Devil's Arroyo, there is one location where there's probably 20 of these plants and all the other ones have been planted, are their explants or outplants um, from the nursery. So this is uh, quite rare. So only one known location in the wild plus outplants from um, uh, San Bruno Mountain Watch. Okay, now this one is uh, gone. Pacific Bleeding Heart only grew along uh, a creek bed. And when they put in the uh, highway, the uh, Guadalupe Parkway, they paved over it and uh, it's not been seen. We've looked for it extensively along creek beds and have not found it. So, there's some interesting stories about reintroduced plants. Now I showed you the Leo Brewery before. Um, another reintroduced plant, Myanthemum dilatatum, and the final one, uh, the Dune Tansy. And let me tell you the story. So this is Leo Brewer's Manzanita. We saw it before. Jim Roof was a self-taught botanist, grew up near San Bruno Mountain, played there as a child, and he was hiking there and he found some on Powerline Ridge. And he recognized it as an unusual or different new Manzanita. And that was in May of 1964. Unfortunately, a fire came through in September of the same year, burned it all to the ground, and it never re-sprouted, completely obliterated. But Jim Roof was a, a nurseryman and he had taken cuttings in May. And he was an expert in rooting manzanitas. They're fairly difficult. And he grew it in the East Bay Regional Parks Garden where he was the first director. And in 1987, Steve Edwards, who is his successor, wrote a letter to the county and said, would you like your manzanita back? And they were dreaming the possibility of reintroducing it to the wild. So they planted in three different places on the mountain. And nobody wrote down where they planted it, and nobody remembers where it was. 
one person did show another person who showed us. So we know of one location. Oops, let's go back. One location. And a friend of ours, in looking for this, we showed it to him one time, a botanist, who was looking for it. He got lost, and he found another planting of it. So we found two of the three plantings of the Leo Brewery. But it was reintroduced to the mountain. The other one that was reintroduced to the mountain was this, Myanthemum dilatatum. It was grown in the East Bay Regional Parks Botanical Garden and then reintroduced in two places uh, in the mountain. It only grows in one. This is the uh, blossom. We've never seen it mature into the berry, but it spreads by uh, um, rhizomes and uh, it's doing fairly well in its one location. We keep uh, trimming away the ivy and the blackberries and post it so that uh, when the trail crews come through, they don't dig it all up. And then this is uh, the uh, dune tansy was reintroduced to the mountain and it grows now in only two locations. In one location, there's one plant. Another location, there's about three or four. Very interesting little leaf on the dune tansy. So I'll just show you a few things of very limited distribution. Uh, this is the California pipe vine, which has this wild flower you've seen. And the insects smell rotten odors and enter through this area. And then they come down through the path up to the nectar, which is up here on the far left. And it's fertilized by a fungus gnat. And we found a fungus gnat inside one of the flowers and photographed it. Now, this is one that Doug can talk about more when uh, we finish this. This is thought to be vaccinium cespitosum, but a specialist in vaccinium believes it's actually a different species. I can talk about it now if you want. Go ahead, talk about it now, Doug. Um, in the flora, there was there was a, uh, a, a, a an entry for vaccinium cespitosum, and um, these were samples or, or specimens that were in herbariums that were uh, submitted by Elizabeth uh, McClintock and a few others uh, back in the early '60s. And um, the, at head, the head of botany at the time, Dr. Peter Frisch at California Academy of Sciences was looking at some of these samples. And he um, noticed that in one of, one of the specimens there were, that was labeled vaccinium cespitosum that he had actually had two different things looking at. He was looking at two different things. So, um, he emailed me, wanted to know about uh, the location of uh, Kamchatka Point, which is where it, it was located at. And I said, well, why don't you just meet me at the mountain and I'll show you where it's at, you know, where Kamchatka Point is. And this was in uh, July of 2012. And uh, he brought a, an intern from China with him and the three of us combed all over the place and couldn't find it. At the time, there was an infestation of the Western tussock moth which is a native moth, and it actually decimated a lot of the Arctostaphylos silverbiculata. So um, in October, uh, we had a, a technical advisory committee meeting for the Habitat Conservation Plan, and the head of, uh, of parks uh, uh, put this on the agenda for the infestation of the tussock moth, and my name was attached to that, so I had to go down there and check it out. So while I was checking it out, I happened to find this particular cespitosum and uh, called Peter up and, and uh, we took some, some uh, cuttings and that. So long story short, um, he was submitting it. So you can see the picture that David's showing here right now that the flower has these prominent uh, lobed sepals and um, the true cespitosum ha would have uh, no sepals at all. It would be a, a, a just a, a, a basic circle or maybe a little wavy, a wavy. Um, and um, so he got suspicious about this whole thing and they ran some DNA and they came up with the fact that a lot of the Polynesian uh, uh, cespitosums do have these prominent uh, lobes on them, but how in the heck did would this have gotten up on San Bruno Mountain? Um, 
and, and, and at the time too, this would have been the the, the most southerly uh, location known of uh, on the coast. The next northerly uh, uh, population is uh, on Point Reyes. Um, so he put a paper out and submitted it to Madronio down at Santa Clara University, and uh, they had some questions. And so he came back. And anyway, over the last couple of years, they've settled on the fact that there's also vaccinium ovatum up there, evergreen. Uh, 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 huckleberry, and in fact, it, huckleberry that huckleberry is all, in a lot of places on the mountain. So we've now come to the conclusion that um, it is a hybrid of uh, the uh, ovatum because ovatum has the very same uh, lobes that that this has. So um, he submitted, resubmitted the paper, and it's probably, hopefully, going to be uh, approved here in the next few months. Uh, he gave me permission to, I wanted to include it in the book because um, it's because the plant is there. Cespitosum, as far as we know, is extirpated. We've looked for it and looked for it and looked for it. Uh, although uh, there is a lot of, of Arctostaphylos imbricata, the San Bruno Mountain Manzanita, which over the last, I, I go back in the park 39 years and uh, over the last maybe 15 years, it has really come down the, the western side of, 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 the, of Kamchatka Point. And so it's possible that the cespitosum just got totally overrun by, by the San Bruno Mountain Manzanita. So we have included it in the book, uh, hopefully, and it will probably be known as uh, Vaccinium X for uh, hybrid Bruno Enz for San Bruno Mountain. All right, thank you, Doc. All right, so. Some beautiful species just to show, then we'll finish off. This is the uh, Silene schooleri of the simple campion. It's uh, uh, quite different than the um, uh, Barracunda. Uh, the claws are different, the color is different, the uh, shape is different. Um, this is a, just a pretty picture of the dog violet. And uh, Sodalcia, checker bloom. Gorgeous uh, plant, fairly common. Um, we have acres and acres of hummingbird sage. And as Doug has taught me many times, some of the plants don't know what time of year it is because they'll be blooming uh, every month of the year. Uh, it's amazing. Uh, this is common, but gorgeous. It's down in our canyons, uh, Pacific Hound's Tongue. Um, this is common sticky seed. Um, it only grows in a small area on one of the ridges. Um, blue dick is not always blue. Sometimes it's white. And Doug has a theory why it's called blue dick. If uh, you're out there uh, as a botanist, you say, here's some uh, diclostema. Oh, here's another diclostema. Oh, heck. They just call it dick. Here's some old blue dick. I don't know whether that's true or not. Um, Wood mint, very pretty little uh, flower. Get up close with a magnifier, you can see it. And that's the end of the flower. So what's really new that's going on? Elizabeth McClintock was at the California Academy of Sciences. And in 1968, she wrote this, A Flora of the San Bruno Mountains. Then in 1990, the CNPS published a book form of it that was updated a flora of the San Bruno Mountains. But for a flora book, it's all black and white and there's almost no pictures of flowers. So with the help of the California Native Plant Society uh, and Heyday Books and a lot of other uh, supporters, both scientific and financial, we're able to produce the natural history of the San Bruno Mountains, which will be in full color. Every page will be in full color. And each plant has a picture of the flower, the leaf, the whole plant and whatever interesting aspects about it, thorns or whatnot. We started work on January 19th, 2013. And eight years and a month later, we turned in the manuscript to Heyday Books. There's 538 plants described, 80 of them uh, have not been previously known to be on the mountain. And it should be available in fall of 2022. And we are certainly glad that the work is out. 
our work is done. Now we're just going to be working on the editing. And we hope to see you on the mountain. Uh, Doug leads hikes on the mountain six a year. When the COVID's over, it's in our um, uh, club brochure. And um, we'll see you on the mountain, hopefully give you a tour and show you some of this in person. Thank you very much for listening. It's been great to be here. Doug and I can now answer any questions. Well, thank you both. That was fantastic and great, great photos, great information. Really, I felt like I was all new to me. So even though I've been there. So thank you very much for that. Um, we did, first of all, have some questions and I don't know if you have a map or something that you could share, but there were some questions. You mentioned some landforms that people weren't quite placing like Pacific Rock and Manzanita Dyke. And I did a little searching around and I couldn't quite find them, so. There's a reason why you can't find them. Um, they're off the path and they're not accessible unless you have a permit from the county. Okay. So both of those, Pacific Rock and Manzanita Dyke are off the geologic features, which are enjoy and the talk, right? That's basically yeah. it. Okay, great. Um, someone asked, and you, this is an optional one, can you tell the story of the helicopter rescue? I saw that and I, I, have, to, uh, I have to take this one over, David. <laughs> um, uh, we were out with Jim Shevok a couple of times, and Jim is a retired uh, botanist from Humboldt. Or he was in the National Forest Service, and he's uh, at California Academy of Sciences. And uh, he's a moss guy. He's written a book on mosses, and I'm sure some of you have it. And so he's been out with us a couple of times, and very gracious guy. And uh, uh, for his age, he runs circles around the two of us. Um, anyway... He was, he discovered a hornwort with a friend of his. And so uh, he told us about it. And um, David being kind of the bryophyte, he kind of got bit by the bryophyte bug. Um, and uh, he decided one Saturday he was gonna go out and find it. So I told him, I don't wanna go do that, you know, but, uh, but uh, I'll tell you what, I said, I'll drive over to the uh, parking lot uh, at the, uh, base of Devil's Arroyo over in the, um, uh, where the warehouses are in, in Guadalupe Valley in Brisbane. You know, and I said, I'll, I'll wait there until you get down and, you know, we'll go back, I'll, I'll give you a ride back to the parking lot. I get this telephone call of, it's about 11 o'clock and David says, I'm down in some gully. I, I'm dead tired. I, there's poison oak all around me. I can't get out. And uh, you got to come and get me. So um, I get in my, in my in my Explorer and I go over there and he tells me, he says, I'm on the old horse road, the old horse. And so we actually found this, this path that was very, very visible in 2003 after a fire, but it had gotten overgrown. And it's an old, it's an old horse trail that, that goes uh, uh, down uh, one of the ravines and uh, goes down into Brisbane. So I started up that, that, that uh, path and I'm hacking, I, I had my saw with me, I'm sawing stuff down. I'm, yay, David, where are you? Where are you? And the, I can't hear him, he can't hear me. So finally he, he calls me again and he says, you, you, you're gonna have to call, uh, 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 you, somebody's gotta come here and get, get me out of here. So I made a telephone call to our Ranger 4, uh, Priscilla Alvarez and, uh, she got lost down there and I had to go get her and bring her back to where we were. And um, next thing you know, we had the Brisbane Fire Department, the Brisbane Police Department, the Highway Patrol, um, sheriffs, rangers, all, all standing around. And um, all of a sudden this CHP helicopter comes flying over and flies up on the ridge and uh, parks up there for a bit to get the, uh, the chair out and um, anyway, I've got video of this too. Uh, it, it came right back around and uh, uh, David had uh, uh, had some coordinates uh, from his uh, Theodolite uh, app. And so they knew exactly where he was. And these two firemen decided to go into um, these will this, this large bank of willows that's along the creek that goes up that uh, goes up uh, uh, Devil's Arroyo, 
And if David had told me the old Crystal Cave Trail, I would have known what trail he was on. But these two guys hacked their way through these willows and through the poison oak to locate him. And the helicopter came in and picked him up. And um, anyway, and, and brought him uh, back to civilization and dropped him down in the big turnaround circle uh, right next to the parking lot. So, uh, so he got saved. And his brother, John, who is an artist, um, uh, illustrator down in uh, the Los Angeles area, did a, just a hilarious drawing of his brother sliding down um, a, a ridge feet first and uh, with his hat flying off and everything else. But anyway, that's the helicopter story. <laughs> so that was embarrassing enough. You didn't have to tell it so long, but it's unfortunately true. Back to you, Judy. What year was that? Are you, you recovered by now? Uh, oh yeah, I think it was two years ago. Oh, okay. Not too much poison oak, I hope. Well, the, I went and visited the firemen later and they said they got the worst case of poison oak oh. they've ever uh, had. I did <laughs> not need to take systemic... Uh, uh, steroids, but I did have topical and I got the worst case I've had as an adult and stung by nettles. I mean, it was a miserable experience. I don't recommend it to anybody. Okay. So everybody stay on trail, which comes to another question. What do you recommend right now for a good flower hikes right now? Uh, right now, I, I recommend that you wait. <laughs> yeah. Doug? Um, well, uh, um, my favorite, okay, the, the thing about San Bruno Mountain State and County Park is, is that a lot of the, um, a lot of the places that David and I like to go are still not part of the park. Uh, the County, uh, Buckeye and Owl Canyon, which are, which are adjacent just to the north of, um, of Brisbane, are two very fascinating canyons. In fact, most of those fern shots that David was showing you when you thought you were in Costa Rica are, are from Buckeye Canyon. And um, so Buckeye and Al both uh, have, they are oak madrone, uh, or, uh, oak bay uh, riparian areas uh, with uh, seasonal streams. And in fact, there is a, there's a shell mound in, in Buckeye Canyon um, and um, I could probably do some kind of a, a hike, but uh, not CNPS sponsored. Uh, but uh, you know, we uh, we actually did one last year, right? Right in between, we did the Daily City Dunes in early June of 2020, and our our chapter president and and uh, uh, our our field trip uh, uh, coordinator and a couple of other uh, uh, board members were on the. We're on the walk and we only had like 15 because I wanted to keep it low. And, um, and then about a week later, we found out chapter council said uh, no more hike. And they were, they, you know, they canceled them. So, uh, so those daily city dunes is one thing, but yeah, Buckeye and Owl are good. If you. Well, they're also good right now, Doug, because it's warmer over there. So yeah. they're a little bit ahead of the rest of the mountain. Yeah. That, that side, that side, that side of um, uh, uh, that area is about, six weeks ahead of, of, uh, of the north part of the mountain. The, the radio road, which goes up to the summit, has been closed for about six months, and I don't know when they're going to open it. If you would park in the auxiliary parking lot across from uh, the uh, parkway from the main entrance, you could hike up uh, the summit trail and go up to the summit. The ridge trail, which comes off of that, is, would be good, too. Uh, but the Summit Trail is a very, very good trail. It's a two and a half, probably a two and a half mile loop from the parking lot up to the summit and then back. If, uh, and uh, it probably is one of the most species rich trails that we have there. The Ridge Trail. Yeah. Okay, great. The Southeast Ridge Trail, that is? No, this is a Summit Trail. Summit Trail. Okay, yeah. good. That's and a, that, if you the map up, on the yeah, if you website. Up, if you pick up one of these at the parking lot, the maps in there, you can open it up and it, it'll show you all the different trails. Mm -hmm. Bob Trail is pretty good I think too. I'm looking That's at right. it. Yeah. It's a state and county park map, right? Together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a question. Since you featured a lot of manzanita, is there one time that all the manzanita are flowering? All the different man manzanita taxa. If not, what time can you see the most? Right now. 
<laughs> right now, okay. Uh, January, January, February, and early March. Uh, our, 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 all of our manzanitas are, are pretty well, much blooming then. So, yeah, this and is you can time. hike up to the uh, um, upper parking lot because right now Rady Road is closed, and you can uh, go to Kamchatka Point and see uh, two manzanitas there. You can also hike the Ridge Trail, and within a quarter mile, there are three different species growing there. Okay, great. All I hope the legal I trails. Outside, got that. Um, and so uh, w someone asked what geologic terrain was derived from the Rockies, and someone responded that it was San Francisco terrain. Is that correct? Right. The San Bruno Mountain terrain mm -hmm. uh, is formed from granite from the Sierras, and the Rockies formed other terrains to the east that were um, um, formed much earlier. And San, Bruno, or San Francisco is formed of three different trains. The Alcatraz train, the Marin Headlands train have um, uh, potassium in them. They're from the Rockies. Okay, great. Uh, we've got a couple questions on YouTube, a little different. Um, I am growing, I'm not sure if this is up your alley, but I'll ask it. Um, I'm growing Heterotheca sessiflora subspecies Belanderi on Bernal Hill. What can you tell me about this plant, growing conditions? And what companion plants would you suggest? So I'm not sure if that's something you would know about. Neither, but. neither, neither one of us are real. Well, I think Dave is a little bit more of a gardener than I am. I, at one point, I had to uh, kid him. He'd, he'd always take a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and put it in his backpack. And I'd say, gee whiz, David, I said, another couple of years, we want every, the, whole, the entire mountain will be in your backyard. Um, uh, uh, Heterotheca, I, you know, it grows in, it, it, it likes dry areas uh, in here. Uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a wet area plant. And, um, it, it'll get a little fog in some spots, but... Um, uh, the only other thing that's fascinating that grows with that is uh, purple owl's clover. Uh, that's the only one I can think of uh, because it's a, it's it's a hemiparasitic, and it's it's hemiparasitic with with uh, heterotheca. No, oh, that's good. That's not always you don't see a lot of that in gardens though. No or uh, pedicularis. So someone mentioned that they hiked Buckeye yesterday and another manzanita. Can I send a uh, Doug a JPEG? So, um, did you guys want to share your email addresses or an email address or? Well, somebody? you know, as, as far as far as um, as far as some of the questions about where to, um, it would probably be easier for me to just to describe it in an e email. I, you know, yeah. I can tell you how to get to from chat to point. So yeah. my my uh, my email address is Doug D O U G. Uh, the abbreviation for senior S R, so it's D O U G S R two two eight at Comcast.net. Okay. Uh, I think they wanted to I they wanted you to identify a manzanita. I suspect that's what it is. Oh the the one buckeye but buckeye is crustacea. Okay. Yeah. It's not what is listed in Elizabeth McClintock. Yeah, this is a funny. Here's here's a funny thing, uh, Judy. Um, Elizabeth listed it as glandulosa, and uh, and it's listed as glandulosa in in the California Academy of Sciences. And it wasn't until our buddies, Mr. Parker and Mr. Basie, uh, really got down to the nitty gritty of it. And um, back in the day. Uh, when those when those specimens were taken in the 50s and the 60s, everything was about hairs. And it turns out that a lot of our manzanitas are of the similar species are hairier on San Bruno Mountain than they are anyplace else. And so a lot of these really, really good botanists call it glandulosa, uh, but Parker and Basie have come up with the... Uh, the stomata, so they are stomata, so they are, uh, they go by, is it on the upper surface, the lower surface, both surfaces? Um, so it turns out, as, as we always used to say, that San Bruno Mountain is an island of open space surrounded by a, a sea of, of uh, civilization. Uh, and uh, Mike Vasey uh, told me in an email that, uh, uh, crustacea is an island surrounded by a sea of glandulosa, so it's it's uh, it's crustacea. 
Thank you for that. I, I know there are people listening who really do want those details and, and we're just seeing Manzanita all over the place right now. So the more we pay attention to it. So um, we also had, uh, thank you for that. And then um, David is actually answering questions in the chat right now. So someone asked about the beautiful flower backgrounds, the beautiful photos with the black backgrounds. And he answered that it is a fine felt that you use. You put yeah. it behind them when you're photographing? Correct. Um... Uh, you want to get her a very fine nap felt. The longer one will uh, reflect light. Uh, bring an umbrella or Doug. Doug's job in the flower photography was the sand, so his shadow was over the flower. Otherwise, I had to use an umbrella. But um, if you put the black felt down and then pay attention to your exposure, because your camera is going to get driven crazy by the black background. But I um, I like it because so often you lose the foreground in the background. There's so many other things, grasses, leaves, other flowers. And um, if you want to isolate it, um, you do that. Uh, I might prefer on an artistic basis, a blue background, but the advantage of a black background is you can change the exposure compensation in Photoshop and black stays black and you can get your plant to finally come out. Um, each of those photos is probably over an hour of photoshopping to fix it. The black typically is not totally black and I have to paint out the black in Photoshop, but mm -hmm. because you have black right next to the plant, you don't have to do a perfect job. Right, so it's not, it's felt, it's not velvet, someone asked. Excuse me, yeah. velvet, pardon me. Well, it is velvet, okay. Not great. felt, pardon me, velvet. So velvet, velvet is less shiny. Yeah. Okay. Great. It's fascinating. Um, I saw, so I saw, I saw a question about the summit flowers for the summit trail. Summit when uh, when is best? Yeah, uh, April. Um, Any time be, uh, between uh, late March and uh, in May. Mm -hmm. Great. But April April is a really good month. Yeah, and there's uh, are there things to see in the summer and the fall too. It's a nice cool place to hike in the summer, right? With the fog. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But that's why we go other places. <laughs> yeah, I right. It can get David and I when we were a, a couple of a couple of years ago. Uh, we've been, been since we found the uh, the Silene Veracunda, uh, we have um, been on a five year uh, uh, doing uh, studies and reports that, and uh, we submit to the county, and uh, we've been up. Um, we've been up on uh, on on a ridge right south of the the South Tower radio tower up there on a foggy day when the wind's blowing about 25 miles an hour. And I'll tell you, that's the last place in the world you want to be. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think that's all the questions we have um, right now that I can see. Oh, I got one here. Uh, DNA research on Bay Area Silene Barracunda populations will be underway pending funding. If you can help, contact me. And that's a, um, a member of the Yerba Buena chapter. Um, so we'll send that to you. We'll make sure you see that. So I don't know if you knew about that. Yeah, I'm uh, running the show and uh, that's probably from um, uh, Denise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So she's that's, uh, uh, that's helping she's, uh, we, part of it. Good. Okay, good. So there's a lot of research going on. What, what would your number one uh, unicorn plant that you haven't seen yet or haven't found yet that was considered extirpated be? What would you be the most excited about finding? Trifocerea floribunda. Try for the try the the Johnny Tuck or whatever it's yeah no. yeah yeah San Francisco owls clover that San Francisco owls clover. Clover. That, 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 that would be the unicorn what? to find that one of those common names one of those owls clovers that sounds great is is it completely is it just extinct on the mountain or extirpated in the mountain or it's found elsewhere elsewhere I think there are some populations in San Francisco but well no I think they're only in um, um, Point Reyes. Right. And uh, the Presidio uh, Natural uh, Studies area are trying to reintroduce it to the Presidio. Oh, okay. great. Um, and then one more question. Did, can you say anything about the small wetland? Which one? I'm not sure. It's the one up top, the one on the top. Well, the... Uh, the bog, probably. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, yeah, the bog, well, the, yeah, the bog trail is the only really a wet kind of wetland well no there are two of them uh 
Uh, the other one is is uh, is in South San Francisco, and that's where the other shell mound is too. Um, uh, and it's right off of um, it's right at the Brisbane Sa South San Francisco border. But the only really other wetland that we have is um, just uh, uh, west of the main parking lot, the Bog Trail. Um, Colma Creek runs down through it, and um, hydro uh, the the hydrology of the mountain is is that on that particular area above it in the saddle, all the water runs down, eventually makes it down into this, this bog area. And so it's sitting at about maybe 700 feet above sea level, which is quite unusual to have a wetland that high up. Mm -hmm. And it's only about five minutes walk from the parking lot, the That's main parking next. lot, very yeah. easily accessible by trail, beautiful place to go. Even on a cold, windy day, you drop down in the bog and it's still, Nice. So is San Bruno Mountain uh, State and County Park experiencing the same kind of high visitation rates and pressure from increased visitors and new visitors as all the other parks in the area? I, 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 I live, you know, it takes me about um, five minutes to walk from my house to the Crocker Gate, which is on right, right where Crocker Avenue runs into South Hill Boulevard. And um, it's a free gate. Um, used to be maybe I walk very early in the morning, but you know, I, I go by there a lot when I'm on my way to the grocery store or whatever. And, uh, um, used to be maybe 15 or 20 cars nowadays on, on a good day, there's 50 cars out there. And, uh, uh, the park is actually, I think tripled or quadrupled their usage, uh, counts, uh, uh, uh just since COVID's come along. So. Yeah, it's happening everywhere. Yeah. Good in some ways, but it's stressful too <laughs> for some parking lots. And uh, another question coming out on YouTube, what is the status of the Daily City Dunes? Status of the Daily City Dunes is that part of the, uh, the a family that owned a piece of it, uh, uh, right down below the dunes uh, is a, a school and John Kennedy School, and they're in a street called Bonnie Street, and there are houses on that street. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, somebody graded part of the dunes, and so there's this flat, really hard-packed area, uh, and I, there's, I always tell people if you're going to go to the dunes, there's, address it from the top of the dune and go down, and then you can come around to the back side where it's out, where the lee the lee side has some vegetation growing on it. So some trails have been established there. But if you try to walk up the bald side of that of that dune, it's an exercise in futility. Um, the the um, a school bought part of the property, and the uh, offspring of the owner of the property uh, were uh, up behind uh, Bonnie Street has donated that to San, to San Mateo County. So it's part of San Bruno Mountain State and County Park now, although they, don't, they haven't done anything with it. Um, it's mostly just a place where the locals around that area like to go and get their exercise. Mm -hmm. But it's cool because we've got the lysingia, the, um, uh, the spine flower, which, and, and this lysingia, both of those plants is the only, are the only populations in San Mateo County they both used to go all the way across the sunset in the Richmond with the dune system out there. And of course, that's all been built over. So this is, these are two isolated populations, the Presidio and the Daly City dunes. Uh, there are also four, uh, two species of Camasonia, little dune uh, sun cups, and two species of Camasoniopsis, including a Southern California uh, species, Bistorta, which... Uh, Thankfully, to the efforts of our good friend Mark Sustridge, uh, has grown from about four plants to about 300. So uh, it's doing very well. That's great. So, how many plants, how many species will be um, included in your book? 538. Wow. And over a, a how many uh, acre property are you including? Uh, about, well, if you uh, 3,000 acres. That's a lot of species in this That's small, a lot of species. small area. And, yeah. and, and you factor in that we have three endangered and one threatened butterfly up there, you know, and these other endemics, six endemics, you know, for just the size of this 
mountain it's or for the little size of this mountain the footprint yeah. is an awful lot of stuff going on yeah and the first habitat conservation plan in the that's right in the country yeah that's fantastic so uh david for those who are not on youtube uh, on zoom rather that he's mentioning that 40 maybe even 30 years ago the bog was an open grassland now it is overgrown by willows and impossible to travel through the area except on the bog trail which is maintained by the county so thank you for that additional information that's the main yeah. wetland they're uh, easily accessible for the parking lot. Yeah, interestingly, I have a, in fact, I did a, I did, I do this mountain journal for our, for the Yerba Buena chapter. It's a seasonal uh, uh, chronicle of just what I've seen and what happens. And, nice. and it could be plants, animals, and whatever happens. Uh, but a friend of mine gave me a, uh, a calendar page from uh, an Ansel Adams calendar and this photograph was taken back in the 40s. And it was on San Bruno Mountain up there where the, the very North Tower is and looking back into San Francisco. And um, uh, you're back in, David found some old aerial photographs. And actually, if you look at the angle that he photogra photographed it, it looks like a park that's pointing right at San Francisco. Uh, David's aerial photographs showed it to be more like an arrowhead but somebody had planted back in the, uh, the late 19th century cypress trees in this pattern and they grew up uh, to that. And the bog trail well, at that time was being grazed. And so it was just devoid of all scrub and it was just nothing but a, 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 a big grassland and a bog. So uh, over the years that's filled in with scrub and uh, you know, it's still a nice place to go though. And there are two uh, cement cow water troughs in the bog, mm -hmm. which are living testimony to the fact that it used to be grassland. And if you don't burn or graze grassland, it turns to scrub. And using uh, aerial photos dating back to 1943, the uh, estimate is we're losing 11 acres of grassland per year to scrub. And the uh, native plants, they, don't do well in scrub. They need grassland. We're going to lose them if we don't do something. But most of the fires there, most recently, have been uh, accidental, right? They have. There's not prescribed burning going on. Well, the last prescribed burn will probably remain the last prescribed burn after it uh, burned to within about ten feet of the multi-million-dollar homes at the edge. I doubt those homeowners are going to be very supportive of uh, proscri or, uh, prescription burning, which is really what we need. We either need that or children to put down their uh, iPads and play with matches during the summer, which <laughs> happened um, in the 40s and 50s. I've talked to adults who say as children, they played on the mountain and there were multiple fires every year. Mm -hmm. And if you go back in history, the Native Americans wanted the Forbes. So they burned the grasses to let the Forbes do better. When the Spanish came, the, mon the money was hides. All they wanted was grass. So the um, Mexicans and then the Spaniards prohibited the natives from burning. Then we got enough civilization. The children took over the uh, uh, task of burning the mountain every year. And with um, uh, modern times, they're not out there playing with matches and the number of fires are rather low. And they're put out very rapidly. But fire, as our audience probably knows, fire is not the disturbance. Fire suppression is the disturbance, which is killing the mountain. But it's a, it's a tricky question. And when you're in a, surrounded by such a dense area, dense population. Absolutely. Well, the problem, <laughs> yeah, the, pro the problem is, is that, is that the, um, a lot of these areas, uh, David was describing uh, the, the Wax Myrtle Ravine fire, which was in 2003. And um, it did burn. It, I mean, the, 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 the nice thing about the whole thing is, is that every, every, whoever was called to the fire, all of these various departments down the peninsula backfilled all these, all these, uh, these uh, vacancies. And so uh, that worked out the way they wanted it to. But the problem is, is that and then again, in 2008, uh, uh, we had a, a, a big fire that burned Buckeye and Owl Canyon up to the ridge and down the other side heading for South City. The problem is, is that these places didn't burn for 40 or 50 years. And once they burn, 
the best thing to do is come back and reburn it within a year or two. And yeah. then, then you're not dealing with as much fuel load and you can start to uh, basically make a difference. All right. Um, so there are a couple of questions, a couple more, and then I think we should probably call it at that point. I don't want to wear you out too much. It's still a, a school night. Um, how to see the serpentine formations in the floor and serpentine flora at San Bruno Mountain? Is there a particular trail for that? Yes, uh, the particular trail doesn't exist. There is an area of serpentine that is probably in the neighborhood of 50 feet by 100 to 200 feet. Um, we have not been able to find any serpentine endemics and not really any serpentine facultatives. Um, um, so there's very little serpentine. Um, McClintock did find another area of serpentine that is now so uh, buried in poison oak, no one in the right mind would ever go there. And I assure you, uh, I've been accused of not being in the right mind for many places I've gone, but that's a place I won't even go. I have to do it from aerial photos, I guess. Um, so someone mentioned that on the road by the towers, we saw a bunch of low growing toyon removed. Was it, is that to keep the grassland? That was the road below the top towers that starts on quarry road is is there maintenance being done on on um some of the shrubs to maintain the absolutely grassland? Um, okay. it's done by primarily volunteer labor uh they're cutting um i would be surprised if they're really cutting toy and mostly what they're cutting is the coyote brush um mm -hmm. and uh san Bruno mountain watch is growing in their nursery various plants and they're being outplanted out there um mm -hmm. And it's a, a valiant effort. Anybody who's interested, of course, you probably have opportunities in Santa Clara County, but uh, there are volunteer opportunities for clearing coyote brush on the mountain or planting uh, plants. Yes, we, we do have quite a few opportunities through our chapter and through the uh, park agencies and open space agencies. So I guess we should wrap up our outside questions, but if there's anything you wanna add about your book, um, when it's coming out and where people should look at it, look for it and anything All else right. about that. Yeah, thank you, Judy, for that entree. Um, if anybody would like to help support it financially because we're $50,000 short of the funds it needs to get it to print, uh, but we do have a GoFundMe under San Bruno Mountain, uh, um, Natural History of the San Bruno Mountains. Um, and it should be uh, available in fall of 2022. And if you just watch uh, your newsletter, we'll certainly post it there. So basically, though, uh, to, to, to kind of just lop on top of that, um, when David, uh, you know, the, the funniest things can happen to you when you're leading a field trip, you know, and so this is basically how all this started. Um, but anyway, um, the two of us just uh, glommed onto each other as far as uh, uh, David knows how to do some things that I don't like to do. And I, and I know stuff that he doesn't know or doesn't like to do. And so we've, we've formed a good partnership between the two of us. Uh, but our, I, when I started out, I didn't really want to write a flora, but that's what we did. Um, and so what we did was we basically took this, uh, this, this book right here Mm -hmm. floor of the San Bruno Mountains and like David said you know this is what the inside of it looks like so um, we decided that um, uh, well this is the 21st century so uh, we're, we're at the end of the 20th century I go with 21st century and so we decided that um, digital photography was pretty cool so we could put some color photographs in it um, a lot of the geology that is in the old is in the 1990 flora is not what we're talking about today mm -hmm. and so we decided that we could just bring it up into the you know just redo the whole thing and add on to a lot of the things that that elizabeth started and uh so we, we we've gone deeper into the histories we've gone deeper into the geology uh we've gone deeper into weather and climate and um uh obviously deeper into hopefully the understanding of of these plants on a semi-scientific basis and um uh so that's that's basically what we that was our goal and i think we actually accomplished it is it going to be sold as an ebook not at this time okay 
The, the publishers don't like that. <laughs> no, I guess. They're hard to update, I think. That's the main thing. So it's tough to sell the books. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, so yeah, so we'll keep in touch. Um, I don't think I have the link to the GoFundMe, but people should look on the Yerba Buena chapter site. Is it there or the uh, San Bruno, Friends of San Bruno Mountain watch or um, I put it in the uh, 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 chat. Okay. Great. But you can also just Google GoFundMe San Bruno Mountain and that's it. Okay. That's how Great. I just got it. Great. Well, um, well, good luck and thank you very much for coming and showing all those amazing pictures and, and your deep knowledge. I think you're going to have a, you, the visitation was high before, but I think you're going to get a few more people going out there now. So <laughs> we hope so. Judy, thank you for hosting us. Sure. You're welcome. Nice to see you all yeah. and have a good spring. Um, a little bit more rain would be nice, I think. So, Vivian, did you want to say uh, any wrap it up here? Well, I just wanted to say thank you to both of you for speaking. That was an incredible talk. And uh, for all of you who are watching still, don't forget we have more talks coming up. Just go to our website and you can see the listing. And um, I will be ending the meeting now. So thanks, everybody. Have a great evening. And uh, see you at the next